why don't we go ahead and get started today. Um, we will record this session as we have the others and we'll be posting that recording and able to share that in the slides um, as a follow on for anyone who would like to have access to that. So my name is Vatrina Smith. I am a professor of infectious disease epidemiology at the University of California, Davis. I'm the project director on the technical side for the One Health Workforce Next Generation Project. And we're gonna go ahead and launch into the last session for our COVID-19 series. Um, I'd like to pass over to Jutta from our ECHO Institute colleagues um, in order to do the uh, little housekeeping tips. And then we'll go to Afrahoon for their welcome from Dean Bezeo or Dr. Irene, um, just as soon as we've gone through the, um, the best practices from Yuta and the ECHO team. So Yuta, why don't you take it from here and then we'll go on to our Afrahoon colleagues. Yuta, you're muted. If, uh, yeah, <laughs> it gets everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, I will be just uh, quickly walk you through the housekeeping items. We have a full agenda and I'll go into presentation mode, please. Yeah. Um, okay. Are you seeing the slides properly? We can see the, yeah, the agenda slide looks fine. Okay, good. And there we go. Um, so uh, we want to encourage you to turn your camera on if your bandwidth allows so we can get to know you a little bit face to face and keep your microphone muted when you're not talking. Uh, rename yourself, please, so we have an idea who you are. Uh, there is a um, FYT that you can chat if you have any problems um, and preserve the chat functions for your questions, no need to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, unfortunately, today we have a technical problem with the QR code for the uh, PDA app, but we might be able to get that uh, later to you. Um, so the presentation slide will be shared via uh, email after the session, and also if we can get the uh, app QR code generated later uh, on the um, PDA app attestation. Uh, as mentioned, the session is being recorded and your attendance is your consent to be recorded. Thank you for that. We also provide um, continuum professional development US CME credits and uh, there will be a link shared at the end of the session with a short survey to obtain those credits. If you are uh, on social media, here's a link that we will put in the chat also um, on some tips on how to be social here uh, about these sessions. As mentioned, there is interpretation available on the bottom of your screen. You can see this globe and you can choose the language that you want to listen to for this session. And that is it for the housekeeping. I'll pass it back. Great. Thanks, Jutta. So the topic for today is the One Health Approaches to Investigating Spillover, and we're very lucky to have with us several experts that will be on the panel, but we'll also be looking to all of you to share your ideas on how we should work through this One Health scenario. Um, but before we really get started, I'd love to turn it over to Dean Bezeo to provide any opening comments from Afrahoon, and then we'll go to Dr. Bird for the global updates. Dean Bezeo, welcome. Thank you, Watrina, and thank you. I welcome everybody who has come on this call. Uh, it's exciting that we have reached the end of our sessions. Watrina, you have your coffee? So <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm excited that over this period, we have learned a lot from each other, and we have impacted our communities, I'm sure. I want to believe that whatever that we have got from here has been useful to other members who do not join. I want to thank our, our colleagues and partners of the US, Trina, Jonah, Bruce, and everybody for, for organizing this. I want to thank our speakers that have always give us up-to-date information, and I look forward to today. And I also want to thank the USID 
But actually, I would say that he's the main convener because without them, maybe we wouldn't have come together. So I want to thank Marilyn in a special way and her team for bringing us together. And lastly, I want to thank the ECHO team that, have, that put up this, this Muted. In Bizeo, I think your microphone just went on mute by accident. Oh, it went on mute? We heard you I, say I, that you wanted to have a special welcome for USAID, and then we lost you for a few seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. The, I want to thank Marilyn and USAID for their support and bring us together. And I want to believe that this was the beginning, and we will continue to have these sessions with Trina. I hope the challenge is on us now to go through the different topics that challenge our communities regularly by bringing together many, many, many groups. And I want to believe that we have learned enough that we can actually work and move alone to pacify this, this One Health. Lastly, I want to thank our ministries because I know as a fact that the Ministry of Health has benefited a lot from what we share with them and I'm sure that they have put it in, in place. So I look forward to the discussions and the, I want once again to welcome you, all of you that have joined us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trina. Sure. Thank, thank you so much, Dean Bezeo, and, and to your African Secretariat team, who has done such a fantastic job on so many different fronts. We really appreciate the work, both at the regional and the country levels for Afrihoon. Okay, so let's go over to Dr. Bird for our global updates and to kick off our panel presentations and discussion. All right, thank you, Dr. Smith. It's great to see everyone again. Uh, I don't know if you can believe it, but this is our seventh ECHO session. Uh, we've been doing these since the end of March and coming together as a community of practice where we've learned from experts and uh, really uh, in-depth expertise uh, being conveyed to us through this ECHO platform, which has been great. But we've also uh, more and more heard from you, the participants that, uh, that are dialing in, listening in on the video Hello. chat. In today's session, we're really going to try to bring everyone together so we can have a discussion and share lessons learned and some of the key things that we've all experienced in our careers and in our work, and then also the key questions that you might have uh, related to this topic. So I'll start in with my COVID updates and then I'll talk more about that. So hang on just a second. Uh, is that the one? All right. So today's topic is on One Health approaches to investigating spillover and outbreaks, right? And we're the One Health uh, workforce next generation project, right? We're trying to learn and, and share experiences on how to work in the One Health way, the One Health approach, better and better and better. And today's discussion is really a key nexus point of all things that are important in One Health, right? So if you look at this cartoon here of just sort of an Ebola transmission cycle, uh, you, have a, you have a bat reservoir, spillover into other animals, and then eventual spillover or transmission into people. And remember outbreaks, I've said it many times, start in communities and they end in communities and spillover occurs in one person, usually, right? Uh, it could be multiple people, but it's at an individual level, individual people, individual animal contact, right? But then through waves of human to human transmission, you know, the virus or pathogen will spread through our population and cause what we'll recognize as an outbreak. And, you know, this is a cartoon of Ebola. I think a lot about Ebola's and other filoviruses like Marburg, but let's not forget that there's lots of other pathogens, uh, mechanisms of transmission, uh, the arboviruses, you know, certainly you know, things like malaria, dengue fever, uh, chikungunya, these are critically important diseases. Uh, and other uh, animals that you have in some of your countries like camels, for example, from MERS coronavirus and others, right? So. So for the global picture of COVID, uh, this bi-weekly update is similar to the previous several. 
Uh, we've been at a rate of between one to almost two million new cases every two weeks around the globe. And these past, these past two weeks are no different. Uh, we're now at over 8 million confirmed cases around the world in virtually every country in the world, 188 countries. And this is now 1.7 million more con confirmed cases than the last time we chatted. So the arc of the, of the outbreak continues to increase and an increase around the globe. In our Afrohoon of partner countries, uh, there's been a bit of stability, but still increasing, so don't let down your guard. Right now, there's just shy of 30,000 confirmed cases across our eight uh, member countries. Uh, typically, in this space, I give a few interesting big picture updates on breakthroughs or things, and I think the one to highlight uh, to this time is that uh, in the last couple of days, uh, a large clinical trial of the very commonly available drug dexamethasone, which is a steroid drug, was found to improve survival in severely affected patients, right? So this is not a preventive uh, measure. This is not a prophylactic measure. This is when people are severely affected by the disease. They have COVID-19 severe disease and they're on ventilators or requiring supplemental oxygen. And this trial is, is part of a larger effort called the recovery trials, which is a randomized evaluation of COVID-19 therapies. And this is run out of the University of Oxford in the UK. And this is a very well-designed randomized clinical trial of various therapeutics. And you can see the list of them here. So there's some antiretroviral drugs, some uh, uh, antibiotics, some other uh, <clears throat> excuse me, immunomodulatory drugs and convalescent plasma. So these would be people that have recovered from COVID-19 and now they're donating their plasma to treat patients. And the, the new finding from this study is that in their 11,500 patients, about 2,000 were randomized to get dexamethasone, which again is a steroid. And this just down, down regulates your immune system and the immune inflammation uh, that may occur post-infection. And this reduced mortality by, by about one third in the most severely affected. So in those that were the sickest, this helped save one third of the lives of these people. So this is a big breakthrough and something to definitely read more about. You can click the link down in the lower corner of my slide there and find more information on the recovery trial. And then, you know, as the last slide for my updates, these are links to other sites and resources for factual information about COVID-19 and SARS-2 coronavirus. I encourage everyone to look through those lists. You can sort of see what the thrust and the information in each of the links is. And if you need more information, you can certainly reach out to us or search these references here. Okay, so, so with that, we're going to pivot now from me talking and us talking to you and sharing information and now trying to flip the switch and thinking about how we as a community of practice can come together and discuss these issues. So we are a community of practice, but that only exists if we have you, all of you out there, right? So today we're gonna to work on an outbreak exercise uh, with inputs from our distinguished panel of experts that we have. We have three wonderfully talented individuals that are gonna be on our panel, but we're also asking you, you there, please, uh, speak up, raise your hands in the, in the uh, Zoom uh, app uh, uh, tool, or chat your questions in the chat box. Uh, we really want to hear from you and hear your voices and hear your opinions, okay? So let's learn from each other and have fun. This, I mean, this, is, uh, this isn't sitting down and listening to a boring lecture and some old guy with a bunch of bats behind him talk about a bunch of stuff. No, I really want to hear your, your opinions and things. So let's just talk together, right? So... Uh, we're gonna talk about an outbreak. So here's our scenario. Okay, so the scenario we're going to be using as our uh, sort of discussion tool here is, you know, physicians in a regional hospital have noticed five, 15 patients with similar, similar clinical signs present over the past five days. So 15 patients in a relatively short period of time. Each patient presented with a fever, cough, difficulty breathing, and a rash. Over the next few days, several patients progress to acute respiratory distress, and, and of those, five patients died. So about a one-third case fatality ratio, so significant severe disease, yeah? Interestingly, 11 of the 15 were reported to have gone to a cultural event in a nearby national park and forest, okay? So that's our scenario. 15 patients, 
similar clinical signs, sudden onset, 33% case fatality ratios. Some of them had gone to a national forest and park. So you, everyone here now, you are one health professor at the super good university. And I mean, not like kind of okay kind of university. I mean like super duper, duper, duper good. Okay, like the best of the best. And that's you, you are the best of the best of the best of the best at the university, okay? And so because of that and your uh, ex expertise, the physicians have come to you to ask what they should do next. Like what should be the next steps, right? <laughs> so now we're going to turn to a poll uh, and we're going to have you answer what you think, what you, from your perspective, what should be the next steps. So I'm going to, uh, let's see here. I think I should, okay, I'll leave the scenario up. Can, can everyone see the poll? Can you see the poll? I can. Just want to make sure everybody else can. Yeah, I can see the poll. One quick tip though, to make sure it goes well, is anybody who's a co-host or a panelist on here shouldn't touch the poll. Otherwise, strange things happen. <laughs> so everyone, please choose an answer for this poll. Um, there are no wrong answers. Pick the best thing you think is appropriate. Um, but for, for those who are co-hosts, just let, let it run, and then everything will move forward most smoothly. Yeah, so we'll give this a little bit of time uh, for, uh, for people to, to put in their suggestion of what, what should be the, the next step. So just pick one answer. Again, no, no necessarily right or wrong answers. They're all diff different perspectives. You know, uh, I, I probably what I would pick first might be different than what you would pick first. But we want to hear from you. Like, what do you, the folks out there, think we should do next? Okay. So uh, while that's running, I think uh, this is a good time to introduce our three panelists and let them tell you a bit about themselves while people continue to vote and everything. So. Uh, Let's do that now. So I'll turn to the panelists and uh, turn the microphone over to you and let each of you introduce yourself in, you know, in a few minutes about your expertise and background so that the other people on the Zoom get to know you. Some of you I've known quite a long time and some of you I'm just meeting now for the first time. So I'm interested to hear. So let's turn first to uh, Dr. Monica Musanero in Uganda and let her give an introduction of herself. Hello everybody, uh, glad to be here. I've been on uh, only one of these sessions before and I'm glad to be part of the last one. I'm called Dr. Monica Musenero Masanza. I'm a field epidemiologist uh, focusing on um, highly infectious uh, diseases, epidemics, purely. Uh, I like trouble, so I tend to go where trouble is. <laughs> so um, currently, uh, I've, I've, have, I've had a bit of experience in a uh, field working at the front line of Ebola epidemics, so working uh, with uh, Marburg, working with uh, hepatitis, and so many epidemics, so many easy ones and difficult ones. Um, they are difficult ones to manage, they are difficult ones to identify in a number of countries. I was part of the team which was in West Africa on Ebola. And uh, I led the Uganda Epidemiology and Surveillance Unit for a number of years. So basically the top technical person in um, epidemic investigation and response. Uh, in COVID, I work as a senior presidential advisor. So basically I'm um, the scientific brain of the president. I look at the science and advise him so that he can interpret many of the things that come along. I also advise the ministers and um, all the other sectors and work with the Minister of Health together with them in designing the Ugandan response experience. Oh, thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Musanero Masanza. That's fantastic. And yet, uh, Dr. Monica and I have crossed paths several times in the uh, Ebola and Marburg sphere, so it's great having her here. It's wonderful seeing uh, old friends and colleagues uh, show up in these things. It's kind of a, a wonderful treat. So th let's, yeah, turn, sure. yeah, let's turn next to uh, Dr. Irene Nagaga, who many of you will know because she's part of our Afrohoon Secretariat, so we're bringing in the Secretariat into these things, and it's a wonderful sharing of, of uh, ideas. So uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Irene, please introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Brian. My name is Irene Aigaga. I'm a veterinarian by training, and uh, I specialized in uh, 
aquatic ecosystem health. Um, I love working with the environment. Uh, I'm currently serving as a regional program manager for AfroHorn, the Africa One Health University Network. And I'm also a champion of uh, One Health. So uh, we support our member institutions to build uh, One Health competencies and capacity of uh, the frontline uh, responders. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, I, I lost the screen. I thought it had gone off, but oh, yes, no, so I just I, I have to be, oh, yeah. uh, I've participated in all the seven sessions, and I have, I'm happy to be featuring as as a speaker on this on this last session on COVID. Great. Thank you, Graham. Oh yeah, thank you, Dr. Irene. Fantastic. All right. So the next next panelist we'll have will be Mark Nanyingi from Kenya. Uh, Dr. Nanyingi, could you just introduce yourself and let people know your perspective? Uh, yeah, my name is Mark Nanyingi. Uh, I'm a Kenyan. Uh, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, uh, and um, I work mostly on uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers for uh, over a decade on Rift Valley fever response in Kenya and in Uganda and other countries. And um, uh, with the current uh, COVID uh, situation, um, I'm volunteering as a technical advisor to the Kenyan government. And I'm honored actually to be here as a speaker today and learn from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Nice, nice to hear someone uh, working on Rift Valley fever. That's, that was my first first love in virology. Yeah, great disease to study. Yeah, terrible epidemics though, for sure. All right, and, and our last panelist uh, from UC Davis, one of our fantastic faculty that we have here at the school, uh, Dr. Tracy Goldstein. So uh, Dr. Dr. Tracy, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I am a professor here at UC Davis, and uh, my background is actually similar to you, Irene, um, in marine biology. Actually, I worked in marine mammals for most of my career. Um, but for the last 10 years, I've been working on the USA PREDICT project and really thinking a lot about spillover. Um, I've been leading up the, uh, the viral detection side of things and also helping to build capacity in the laboratories in Africa and Asia. And um, this is actually my first um, call with the Afrohoon team. Um, I am the global person for the Seerhoon team, so I've been spending more of my time with the Southeast Asian team. But it's really great to see you all and a lot of familiar faces. So thank you for having me. Yeah, great. Thank, thanks, Dr. Goldstein. Yeah, so Dr. Goldstein, for those of you, many of you will know her from the PREDICT uh, project, those of you that worked on that, but she's a valuable or a very valuable resource when it comes to laboratory uh, testing, diagnostics, and new ways of thinking about how we can find uh, new emerging uh, health threats. So, okay. So the results of the poll are, are, are in, or I think most everyone that's voted uh, wanted to. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the poll to help guide our discussion. So it looks like from our scenario, remember it was 15 patients, kind of similar clinical signs, uh, you know, five of 15 had, were had mortality. Uh, and then what was the next step? Because we're the super duper good university professors, right? Okay, so it looks like the preponderance of people suggested contacting the Ministry of Health first. And that's obviously a great, great place to start. Um, so I think we'll start the discussion there. And maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Monica on that and talk about in your experiences and in your work, when you, when you have a disease cluster, if your first step is going to be contacting the ministries, so Ministry of Health or Ministry of Agriculture, if it was a, an animal disease, how, how that goes, how that would be, and, and any insights or tips you might have for the people listening in on how to manage that process. So Dr. Monica, let's turn to you. Um, Dr. Monica, you're on mute if you're talking. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was saying that uh, in, in, in the Uganda Ministry of Health and in many of the countries uh, where I have been, a situation like this would generate an alert uh, right from the hospital. Uh, in Uganda and in a number of countries, we have now what we call the Emergence Operations Center. The Ugandan one has an alert section uh, where alerts 
are sent out to this centralized system. And there are people who will screen through the alerts. And this one helps to guide uh, the area, the section where the alert goes. Because apart from epidemics, we have other areas where there are alerts, like maternal death. And so they are all sent to this place. And then this situation will be redirected to the technical section of the epidemiology and surveillance unit where we have the epidemiologists and individuals who are continuously monitoring this. And um, before actually the high authorities of the Ministry of Health are informed, there will be a rapid uh, investigation. Basically, these are usually phone calls to the hospital uh, if they are referred to this activity in the park, you call, get a, a information who organized, how many people were attending, get as much information as possible. And uh, usually you bring together a few technical people to sit, understand that information and generate a brief to the leadership in the ministry and the request for an investigation. Now, depending on if there are deaths like in this section, uh, the population, it will quickly reach the press. So generally we draft a brief, a brief for the media in case it is need, not needed. If a situation has not been confirmed, there is hesitation to put out information to the media which will change. But you generate a brief or there's a situation, we know it is there, we are investigating, so far, 10 people are believed, or 11 are believed to be affected, and so many have died. Quickly put it up, and this arms the ministry leadership to be able to communicate. And the next step really is now to send a team from the Ministry of Health to go to this hospital mm. and find out more, and then that will actually define the next two steps. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, at this point, we would like to have the experts from the university. The challenge is we do not have uh, a well-defined program. Okay, before COVID, we, we really didn't have a platform where the university would come in. So, and the university would bring in the expertise about this pathogen to guide the frontline officers in what they are doing. But at the moment, we didn't really have that kind of uh, platform. The One Health platform has not been very participatory in the, in the actual investigation in epidemics, and I'm praying that it comes to be. Mm, yeah, thank, thank you, Dr. Monica. Yeah. That, that's great. I appreciate all those insights there and how the Uganda system is working and some of the challenges you have in integrating the One Health platform more into the system. And I know in many of the countries where I work, that is also a challenge, is trying to get this out front uh, in front of the people and the authorities. So now I want to turn to Dr. Naningi. Uh, so you mentioned you work on Rift Valley Fever. So Rift Valley Fever has an interesting caveat in that in some ways you can try to predict when the big outbreaks will come through the climate data, the rainfall data, because Rift Valley fever is a mosquito-borne disease. Could you speak on how, you know, even before the spillover, so now we're thinking, you know, before in time, for Rift in particular, uh, how you might work with the ministries to help alert them that something is even coming before you even have the first spillover. And that's, that's what we're here. We're trying to prevent disease, yeah? So any insights there, sir? Uh, thank you very much, Brian. So a case scenario of Rift Valley Fever probably in Kenya will be uh, both Ministries of Health and Ministry of, uh, of Agriculture work very closely in a unit called the ZDU, which is a zoonotic disease unit. And uh, uh, there's an enhanced surveillance system. This is a system which actually works very well uh, from the national level to the sub-national level. Uh, whereby they need to get alerts of potential outbreaks of the disease. So what happens is that by phone call or by a developed system, which is a relational database, they will be able actually to provide any clinical signs that will be observed first in animals 
And if there is any clinical signs that we observed in humans, any fever or any associated clinical signs, so these signals, just as, uh, as Dr. Monica had talked about, will be picked by a centralized emergency operation, uh, you know, a command system that is being run probably by the Ministry of Health, which is the Disease Surveillance Response Unit. And um, having that, uh, gather that information together and putting all those information together, then a brief actually uh, goes hand in hand to see if the case definitions actually uh, falls into the class of sites that have been, uh, have been uh, um, developed before. So if you have that kind of a, uh, an observation or a clinical diagnostic uh, a logarithm, then you can actually with uh, certainty send out an alert and say, okay, maybe we suspect this is rich valley fever, so what next? And that's when now the team uh, has to be sent out uh, probably uh, at the sub-national level or probably a team coming from... Uh, of, from the top. And in Kenya, we are very lucky, like Uganda and many other countries, where there's the capacity building of, uh, by the CDC of the, the, the field epidemiology program. And uh, these are the disease detectives that are actually take the, the front line and, the, and the, you know, they put the, themselves in front. And even in COVID, they are playing a very important role in Kenya, whereby they are on their ladder on the front line. So they're the ones actually who have the technical expertise and they are, they are trained uh, across the, the veterinary, medical, and uh, public health actually to go in and have some sort of a synergy in, in a way to, to respond to uh, the highly infectious uh, actually. Uh, uh, Patrick. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Nanyingi. That's great. So, your rift is an excellent example of getting alerts before you even recognize the first cases in, in some, some instances, yeah? So let's turn to Dr. Irene. Since you work more squarely in the animal health sector uh, and in the One Health Secretariat, your perspectives on maybe how you build these linkages across the ministries from, from your work there and uh, some examples you might have or anything you'd like to share on that, that topic. Thank you. Irene, you're you're also on mute. Uh, we we have a we have a acute case of the muties uh, today on the, on the Zoom. I have I have it too. I have a bad case, chronic case. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I'll talk about first of from the animal side, but also from the the One Health uh, perspective. So from the animal side. Um, our link, our connection has always been, it is mainly through the One Health platform that try to formalize involvement of the animal health professionals in the investigation. In most cases, the investigation, as you heard from Monica, it will go to the ESC and then it will be direct to the epidemiology department. And you'll see that most of the work is going to be focused on uh, uh, the physicians working around uh, the human factor uh, and the, it's, it's in most cases by the time they are getting to the environment and animal side you find that you're losing uh, a lot of time yet there's uh, information that we could be co-investigating together so I know that those efforts have been improved over time uh, but still as you had our One Health platform is not very functional so uh, unless if there is a trigger within the animals, which is going now to bring the vets on board outright, uh, and then the investigation starts, in most cases there is that loss of time, and, and sometimes you, you're losing evidence on where the source is. But otherwise, with the One Health approach that we are trying to promote, we are promoting um, our separate collaboration and trying to build um, systems in place and processes that will bring the different sectors on board, but still it has been a challenge to operationalize that as you've had. So in most cases, it is, you, you find that the animal health side is going to, to go to the field on their own to investigate the animal side, and then the human is focusing on, given the scenario that we have, is focusing on the, the human element, but would love to narrow that gap. And we've seen this gap being narrowed when you look at now the, the COVID um, 
scenario, we are seeing debates on the scientific committees. So I'm hoping that we will learn lessons from this to try and uh, make these uh, one head platforms functional because we've built um, this capacity. The, the workforce is, is ready to collaborate and work across sectors, but sometimes you find that the environment is not favorable in terms of policy, but also when there's an outbreak, everybody's trying to run. So it would be good to deliberate on this platform what we can do to try and strengthen these collaborations. Uh, I, I'm happy to learn from, uh, from Mark, the Kenyan scenario, I think the platform is really mature and there's that collaboration which is uh, maybe outright uh, at the, the onset of the investigation, but we need, we need to work on uh, our side, the Ugandan side, to strengthen this collaboration such that the teams are set off the investigations are happening in parallel. You're investigating the animal side, you're investigating the, the, the human side as well, uh, I submit. Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Irene, that's great, that's perfect. So yeah, I think that's a good question about how, how can we draw together the animal and human health sectors in outbreak investigations or, or just routine work. And yeah, let's, let's go back to Dr. Naningi and how did you, or how did the Kenyan government and others working in Kenya really try to bring those two pieces of the puzzle together? Uh, let's hear some insights there. What do you think works? What, di what doesn't work? Like what should we also not try, perhaps? Thanks. Oh, the muties are just spread. We have a we have an outbreak of the muties. Uh, so yeah, there we go. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I think Kenya is um, uh, is making great strides, but it's not uh, like I mean too far away from Uganda, as, as my colleague Erin puts it. Uh, but the whole thing is that there are always institutional barriers uh, or policy barriers, actually, which cannot be easily circumvented by uh, you know scientists or researchers. So there's need to actually to have policies that are high above the political will or probably having, you know, the government, you know, put in an effort actually to break this barrier uh, whereby you, you're going to have people from either side actually coming together to, to harness all the skills in the different, uh, uh, maybe say a laboratorian with a public health expert and a veterinarian and a medical doctor. So... I think we're, we're on the road. I mean, we are pushing the wheel and um, I think our dream is to have a One Health policy very soon. And uh, the One Health policy will actually, you know, seamlessly realign all these things whereby we, we have to build a critical mass of people uh, with skills in, in One Health. And I, I mentioned Feltep. And now also we are starting another new, new program which is in Uganda, it's called ISAVET, which targets actually uh, in-service uh, uh, veterinarians uh, for advanced uh, field epidemiology tra training. And so if you have this, you know, uh, group of people with the, the felt up skills and then you have the ease of it skills and then you are now ex actually expanding, you know, uh, the critical mass of people with skills to, 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 uh, to, to help in a, a response to one, one health uh, uh, outbreak. So I think uh, the universities play an, a very important role because uh, there has to be actually a buy-in actually for the university to provide the expertise and also the university to provide the facilities that actually uh, can assist to train this. So where you have systems that are broken, or probably you have actually uh, the academic institutions, which are, I mean, far apart from the, the research institutions, then you cannot have actually this, you know, this uh, seamless system. So I think it's evolving, and uh, it's a good case study, actually, to use the, the Zoonotic Disease Unit, which is, has been running since, I think, 2012. It's, it's, it's run by very energetic and very young medical and, uh, and, and uh, vet epidemiologists. And actually, they are tapping into all these partners and collaborations. And actually, O'Shea also plays a very big role by putting it in the curriculum, like in our universities, where people are trained actually at MPH level or uh, at uh, a veterinary epidemiology economics level, actually, to, to go in as, as the food, food soldiers and actually be the, the, the next leaders in, uh, in One Health. Thank you very much. Thanks for that perspective. That, that's great. Yeah, and I think these uh, the nascent uh, zoonotic disease units or zoonotic disease task force that I've seen in several countries. Uh, I, I scanned the list for my colleagues from Sierra Leone. They don't seem to be be on the call today, uh, but th there they've also implemented a strong multi-sectoral 
uh, zoonotic disease task force, they call it. And that really helps bring people together because they all sit directly together in the same room. So they're sharing ideas, hopefully not uh, COVID-19, but at least the ideas they're sharing uh, in their rooms. Uh, and uh, that's really helped a lot in bringing this together, uh, okay? So when we look now, let's pivot uh, to a different topic in our poll. So the, the top hit, you know, the most uh, uh, frequently thought of first step was contact the ministries. And we talked about contacting ministries, getting buy-in at the higher level governments. And then we had the nice discussion about how can we bring the ministries of agriculture and environment and health together in those ways. The next, the next uh, uh, preferred choice was to send out a contact tracing team and implement community surveillance. And of course, that's a, a, a very important uh, part of the puzzle, right? We have to figure out, well, is it just 15 people in our health uh, disease cluster or is it many, many more? Uh, and we need to know that rapidly. So uh, Dr. Monica, maybe I'll turn to you and ask you how, what in your, in your experience, how can we do this more rapidly? I think everyone here would understand that we do need to do the contact tracing or the case investigations, but it's the delays in time of getting the teams out, getting the resources and logistic to do it, and then data back uh, to the headquarters, let's say, or the ministries, uh, that, that can really cause uh, small outbreaks to become very large. Uh, we both fought those battles in the Ebola and Marburg world. Uh, so any insights there? What can we do now as a community of practice to help make those delays as short as possible? Dr. Monica. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the first thing is be ready before. Sometimes we use the time when we don't have the epidemic to relax and uh, to diminish funding and support. That's the time when we should really be active because when you already have some people who have some knowledge, who are already sensitized, who are already trained, then that will quicken the process than when you're beginning from uh, converting people from those who don't even believe there is a problem. So if we can be very proactive and train people, uh, make sure they are aware. And this is one of the things that we have in Uganda. We train on all health workers throughout the entire health system. At least every two to three years, there will be a refresher training to cause awareness about these diseases. Now, when the actual disease comes, what we need is simply to do the case definition uh, do a half day refresher training. People already have the principles. So this uh, work about this spillovers has to continue to continue, conti be continuous, not just wait for an epidemic. Because recruiting people, driving out fear, building basic knowledge is one of the challenges. The second one is resources. Resources usually delay investigation because for some reason, I've not found any African country, at least, which has a, a financial system to support epidemics, which is quick. It will take you a week, it will take you. So the mechanisms to get people out there quickly so that they can trace uh, the contacts and uh, possibly identify the source. And um, like Irene was saying, I would really love to see this shift to just sending out people who contact trace only the human beings. We, most of these new epidemics, we never catch the source. We never catch the source because the ecological research investigation comes on too late when the disease has destroyed evidence, has tampered with the scene. So getting these one health teams at all levels because if you're going to take a central team, it may take you long. But if they are closer to the place and we are able to contact and find out the contacts early, uh, we can limit the spread of the disease. And uh, this has been one of the secrets of Uganda in COVID. As you can see, we are lagging, like our numbers are quite low. Why? Because we go massive on contact tracing and containment, very massive on that. And people are trained ahead of time. So the issue is train, mentor. Mentor the people. The university professors should be mentoring these people when we do not have 
an epidemic using case scenarios, using anything which is there. So when we mentor the people, then they'll be filled ready very quickly, then the resources. Those are the two important things. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Monica. Yeah, mentoring and resources. Um, uh, Dr. Irene, would you have anything you'd like to comment on that uh, from those points about how, how can we help foster that? Uh, I, yeah, and Dr. Monica brings a good point about the economics of this. One of our colleagues in the Sayahoon session last night uh, put in the chat that One Health is really one wallet. Uh, and I, there's a lot of truth to that, yes. right? These, these investigations are extremely expensive to do. Uh, they have to be done rapidly. Uh, otherwise, as Dr. Monica said, the evidence is lost or destroyed. The scene has been changed. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Nagaga, please uh, share some perspectives on that, if, if you have any uh, on that, that topic there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, from the One Health side, I would say that certainly it is resource heavy. So that is why we need to promote collaboration and sharing resources and bringing each, other, each other's strength on the table such that we are bit labs, we are using uh, similar labs across maybe the, the maybe even transporting samples if you have that chain that we can transport both human and animal samples and there's that collaboration and sharing data so i think sharing here is going to be critical to cutting back the costs uh, but again i think we also need evidence that when we work together and uh, and share resources then we are cutting back on the costs maybe that is another challenge on us who are promoting this multi-sectoral collaboration that we need to provide but on, on, the, on the other side, mentoring is critical and preparing the workforce in peacetime. As Monica said, we need to be ready, we need to be prepared. And this is something that we've been trying to promote in our networks, to su support universities, to build this workforce ahead of time. Although this approach, we needed to test, you know, we need to, to provide evidence, proof of evidence, which we provided over time. These trainings are, most of them are not institutionalized. So we are hoping that over time, we are going to institutionalize this kind of training where we are building the competencies of our workforce to collaborate, to network, um, to share data and see the value in that for a person to, when you, you're faced with an outbreak, to be able to convene a multi-sectoral team that is relevant to giving information that is going to help uh, defining critical interventions. So we are seeing this has worked in the COVID. So I'm hoping that over time, now we'll institutionalize this and then we'll also promote this kind of capacity building right from the pre-service, but also to equip the in-service with some of these skills that uh, professors are bringing on board during this COVID case. We don't want this to end here. We want to build this capacity of the front line, to build the capacity of uh, people who are involved in, uh, in leading these teams during outbreaks to know that maybe we'll need a vet here, we'll need an ecologist here, we'll need, so such that they are able to identify that uh, the people that, that are relevant to, and critical to the investigation and then we are able to stop and contain uh, the outbreak before uh, it spills over. So from the capacity building side and the logistics side, I think those are the issues that I can think of. Yeah, uh, yeah. thanks Dr. Irene. Uh, I might wanna draw in uh, Dr. Goldstein into this because we're talking about training and trying to get uh, people on the same footing across health and animal sectors to, to be res potential responders to outbreaks or do disease investigations, ecological investigations. So maybe, uh, Dr. Goldstein, could you speak a little bit about, in your work, how uh, you, you've tried in many countries to, to standardize a training platform. That's part of One Health Workforce Next Generation, of which you're the, the global lead on the Sayahoon side, but also under the PREDICT project as well. Could you talk a little bit about that and, and some of the insights from those attempts to build capacity from that side? 
Yeah, thanks, Dr. Bird. I think um, everything that everybody's been raising here is so important. And I think the idea of having people trained and those relationships before the outbreaks occur is probably the most important thing. Um, so as part of the PREDICT project, we um, have been going out and doing our surveillance as One Health um, teams um, and bringing together our people from the lab, the field, and the various ministries, um, including environment, health, and, um, and agriculture, and cross-training together. So that way, you're, the teams are cross-trained to handle samples from animals, people, etc. So then you don't always need um, that big team. And in fact, um, you can start to interchange people who come as you have more people that are cross-trained and the relationships there. Um, and you know, in, in terms of sample collection, I think there's often these ideas that it needs to be different on the human side versus the animal side. And honestly, um, those can be harmonized across species and, um, and samples can be treated in the same way. So I think it's really important to sort of think about breaking down those different sectors and, and having people come together and work together in the field and recognize how many similarities there are rather than differences. And then I, I see some of the questions here asking about, you know, testing for SARS coronavirus 2 in livestock, you know, and have those kits been developed? Honestly, they're the same kits. And so you can do that same work in the lab. Um, you know, in different countries, um, you know, it works to have samples from humans go to human labs and animals to animal labs, but it doesn't have to be that way. It can be together in the same labs. The, um, if you're testing for the same things, the protocols aren't that different. And so again, cross-training. So bringing people from the animal labs together with the human labs and, and learning how many similarities there are rather than differences, I think um, can really help to um, improve that. And then similarly, when you're do, you know, doing your, um, your sharing of results across ministries. So again, the ministries can recognize that the data isn't that different or should be shared. And that's what's happening in, in one sector is as you know um, affecting what's happening in another so i think uh, dr monica you said that um, probably best as to dr irene it's that work ahead of time building the relationships and the networks ahead of time so that they are in place before the outbreaks occur yeah no thanks thanks for that dr goldstein yeah so think, think about what we're in right now we're in the one health workforce next generation project not the one health worker one but the workforce, the, 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 the many. And, and, and as many, we are powerful. You know, as individuals, we have our, our limitations. Uh, but together as a team, we can do lots of amazing things. And that's what these forums, I think, are, 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 are a place for, uh, learning from each other. I even see some of the participants from the Sayahoon session in their morning are, are listening in. Uh, so thank you for joining. Uh, you know, so I think it's that building that community of practice, if you will, or that community of One Health workforce workers uh, is, is very, very important. Because uh, the work we do on the animal side or the human side, it's the same work. They're just slight differences, right? You know, it's, uh, they're subtle things. I mean, where you take blood from a cow could be different than from where you take blood from a person, sure, but it's still blood to go into the diagnostic testing pipeline, right? So uh, we, we can't lose those lessons. And epidemiology principles are, are the same. The principles are the same, but this exact application could be a little different between a herd of cattle or goats or a, a herd or a group of people uh, riding in a subway train. Yeah, it's the same, same principles are there. So uh, thanks for that discussion. So let's go back to our poll and uh, see where we're at at time. So we're coming along okay on time, I think. Uh, so, as I see it, so we've talked about, you know, ministry level, now that the integration of contact tracing teams and the way we would think about the community surveillance and getting out there as fast as possible. The next uh, items are in the animal reservoir uh, discussions and then contacting the Ministry of Wildlife about the cultural event. So I think this is a critical part as well of our puzzle is understanding, well, what were possible risk factors? So uh, maybe I'll turn to, let's see, who have I not called on? Uh, maybe you'll go back to Dr. Nanini and our Kenyan colleague and discuss about if we're sending out investigators to go out and think about what was the source. So now we're trying to get upstream of the spillover, the person in the middle of the triangles. Now we're up above that in my little sort of hourglass figure. 
So now we're asking about the cultural event. So what should we be thinking about in terms of going out and asking about exposure risks and things of that nature? So Dr. Nanini, please. Uh, thank you, Brian. I think uh, <clears throat> it's very critical to do a risk assessment. And in terms of risk assessment, you, you're going to the source. You really want to know where is it coming from? And this will be to assess whether it's by contact or whether this is a, a matter of people actually consuming, you know, like a common source of food because there's a class of people who are coming together or whether these people are in the middle of the forest. Uh, probably there's an animal which they came in contact with or, uh, you know, one of the wildlife animals that they came in contact with. So, I mean, this interface of spillage is what actually you want to establish, and this will be by questioning these people. I mean, asking them uh, a number of very specific questions of maybe what did you eat, what did you touch, uh, which animal did you play around with, and things like that. So having this background actually will make you actually have a very focused uh, now kind of analysis to rule out actually if there's a, there was any whatsoever animal contact, uh, you know, coming closer to, 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 the, to the humans. And, because it's a population-based uh, kind of surveillance that you're initiating, it will be very key also to observe the neighboring areas. Uh, probably, what are, what are the environmental issues that exist in those areas? I mean, does this park actually, is it near uh, any other, uh, you know, environment that can be uh, a source of the contaminant or a source of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, path, of the path, path, pathogen? And so if you have your deceased detectives, you know, putting in their boots and actually stepping down there, they need actually to uh, have a very clear uh, objective of establishing the risk or the risk factors that actually will have uh, led to this disease and actually uh, having um, approaches that will either minimize contact in terms of just interrupting that transmission, you know, the, the chain of transmission. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot of caution that has to be to be taken here because uh, while you're interviewing the, the suspected cases, I mean, you're talking about 11 people out of 15 who are there and probably they were dancing or, you know, they were, you know, playing around. So you want to zero in to those people and if possible to isolate or probably in this case, like COVID-19, we talk about quarantining them and probably observe and see the, the clinical outcome. Um, you create a line list. I mean, this line list will actually help you. First of all, you have identified the contacts and then you, you, you go along actually to have a list. And this will help you actually follow up these people. You can either do by phone. If you're really, really scared and you think this is a really, you know, highly you know, infectious agent, um, talk to them by phone or probably use a local leaders who have influence actually to get to, to, to buy in them and, and start talking to them. And once you move into the epidemic foresight, and this will help you actually to have an overall assessment, which will bring together all these, uh, the, the one health spectrum. So where you're looking at the environment, you're looking at the, 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 the host, if it's a wild animal, and then you're looking at the end host, which is the, uh, the human being here who is, uh, who is sick. So establishing the social network and actually being able to look at uh, the duration of when uh, did this begin and probably for how long did this science actually develop, this will be very key for you to make a, a both an epidemiological decision and a clinical decision on how probably you're going to respond better to this uh, outbreak. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you for that. It takes a real integrated approach and an open mind. I think when we are being the disease detectives and looking for the risk factors, we have to not automatically assume that it's going to be somebody ate a bat and then that got them infected. That, that's not the case. Yeah, you know, we have to keep an open mind. It could be anything, right? So let's not bias ourselves. But you bring a good, up a good point too about talking with the people. And I wonder if Dr. Irene might speak a bit about uh, when we go into communities as detectives or in our outbreak responses, things we might want to do to sensitively engage with the communities and some things we might want to think about uh, on that front, so that we're not scaring people and we're not just sort of some uh, uh, strange people from the outside, you know, from the capital and things. So, Dr. Irene, from your experience on that, and then I'll turn to Dr. Monica for her, okay. her experience. As well. Yes, so maybe to, to add to what Mark has said, it would be critical that, uh, that we engage, first of all, the right people, the leadership of the community, 
is going to be critical for us to enter into this community and get this information. But also who we have on the team, I think we'll need uh, an anthropologist here. We will need a social scientist who knows community dynamics and can knows how to engage in a way that is going to be that is not going to be uh, scary to the to to the community because you want to engage, stop spillover, but at the same time you need to get the information. So we need these professionals on our team to to support us. Maybe we are animal health professionals or we are physicians, epidemiologists. So we'll need this on the team. And also the event manager. I think it would be good to engage the event manager, the person who organizes that cultural event, uh, to walk us through the steps. I mean, how did he organize this event? What was it about? Was it a hunting event? Was it a dance, cultural dance? Did people stay overnight? Could they have been bitten by insects? Did they get in contact with water? So we need to be asking those questions and the patients find have their place in, in telling us, but also the community, maybe did they see birds dying in the community? It's, so we just need all, we need all these clues because at this point we don't know this is a new disease and we need as much information as we can get. So we, we need to get the community to cooperate and give us this information. And sometimes as scientists, we may not know how to extract this information. So bring on the team those competencies and skills uh, of course in the promotion of one health would be very critical to this thank you yeah thank you for that yeah bringing in lots of different experts is is really important you mentioned anthropologists and social scientists uh those have often th those that expertise has often been left out of these teams um and that's, that's very important. I, I've learned so much from those types of experts in these kind of things. So uh, Dr. Monica, this is a really critical issue, I think, this how do we engage with the communities, both to do the contact tracing, but also find out about the risk factors, in our case, the cultural event, things that might have happened. So from your side, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I mean, you've worked at many different levels from the WHO level to the, the, the ministerial level itself, uh, and now in your role as an advisor. So any tips there. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Brian. One of the things that I have learned is that a field investigation is as good as you prepare. Sometimes in the rush to go to the field, you go out with a biased mind and you go chasing what you think is what's there. But when you do preparation, and uh, putting a lot of uh, effort in the preparation to go to the field, you're more likely to solve this puzzle quite early. And in my experience, uh, bringing in a lot of experts at this point, even if I don't go out to the field for one day, but get, my, get the consultants, get the university professors, talk to them, how this disease present, how did it be transmitted, because uh, contact tracing seems to have become very uh, fashionable these days, but not every disease might need contact tracing. Uh, some diseases just need uh, just finding. Maybe this is just a common source one off. So getting the professionals, getting the scientists around the table to guide you just using the information you have and then you prepare for everything is very, very important. And then you keep those links, even when you're in the field, you can keep calling and consulting. This is what so far we've found, what is this? So that helps you to better define, prepare your tools, carry uh, the necessary uh, materials that you need to complete your investigation, and then decide whether, based on the information you have, whether you need to trace contacts, whether you need to protect the health workers at the hospital, uh, then the second thing in Uganda's system is you must engage the local government, the local health authority in the local government, because though you are going there, you're going to support them. They are the, although you are an expert from national, this is also an opportunity to build the capacity of the frontline health workers. So you have to make sure that you've contacted the local government. In different countries, this goes to different levels. But you have to know that you have the local technical people uh, with you. 
And then the way you enter the community through the local leadership will determine whether you succeed or not. Because epidemics are as much a function of how people believe you. Because if people believe you, if people see what, that what you're doing is beneficial to them, they'll be very helpful. But if people see that you're an intruder, you don't respect them, you, they'll reject you. And this often happens with the local political leaders. They may not know the technical things, but showing them courtesy and uh, the importance and going with the local politicians and uh, making sure that they're on your side becomes as important and opinion leaders on the community, you go in as a learner. This is one attitude that sometimes we may forget. When you go to do an investigation, you are not an expert, you're a learner. You're going to learn from the people that you're going to ask uh, things from. Because after a few days of uh, investigation, you should be able to tell quite a lot about a disease, even if they have not yet confirmed it in the lab. You could be able to get collect information that enables you to put uh, control measures in place even before you confirm. Uh, I think those are some things that are tending to be forgotten as we advance in technology. People want a virus to be sequenced, to be characterized before they can put in place control measures. I was trained that even before I know what's causing this disease, if I do a good investigation, asking the community, possibly getting evidence whether some animals died, then I'll be able to put in place interventions to protect other people before I even know what it is. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Lots of great points there from all three speakers. So uh, I, I agree completely with Dr. Monica uh, that you know I say if you want to understand, you must first listen, and that that's so important. You have to go with the right team of people with expertise so that you can ask the appropriate questions. And so you can then listen to the answers and try to understand the disease uh, dynamics, the potential risk factors. And I agree also, you know, epidemiology and disease control measures uh, work uh, if you understand the risk factors and the, the linkages between the cases. You don't necessarily need to know is it uh, this strain of our serotype of dengue fever or this variant of Ebola virus, or even if it's an Ebola virus, uh, that, that's, that's not epidemiology and disease control measures can work even if you don't know the source. And thank God they do. Otherwise, there would be a lot fewer people in the world, right? Because laboratory diagnostics yeah. are, are an ever increasing and better and better thing. And I'm a dyed in the wool lab guy. Uh, but you can do an outbreak investigation and control a disease entity and not necessarily know exactly what's there is the, is the etiology. That's totally possible. Okay, so great things there. I think in our remaining time, let's turn to Dr. Goldstein. And I think she's going to kind of wrap all these things together nicely in her presentation, I hope, uh, to uh, uh, talk about all these from some of her work. And then we'll leave time for questions. So there's questions in the chat box. I see them coming in. And then we'll spend our remaining time just on questions back to the speakers from the participants. So thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Goldstein, uh, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Um, well, you guys covered so much. I almost don't need to um, give my presentation, but I, you know, I'm going to start with this, this photo, which I love because it's the One Health team that we have been working with in Cambodia, and this includes people from the Ministry of Agriculture, the Cambodia CDC, our lab team, and our field team. And so I just sort of really love that um, because I think that is really what we are are um, striving for here. And uh oh. Okay, um, and I also wanted to, you know, I think we've talked a lot about the complexity of, of pathogen spillover, and I really love this image from uh, Raina Plara because it sort of shows all the different things that need to be lined up in order for a spillover to occur. So thank goodness for that, otherwise I think they would occur um, more often. And, and in this outbreak, we've barely been focusing on the virus, but as Dr. Bird was saying, the virus is really just one part of it. It's understanding all of the things that lead to that virus, and that includes what's happening in the vi environment, 
how people are coming in contact with animals as well as what's happening in the animal host. And I think in order to really understand that, we need that multidisciplinary One Health team in order to do that. And in order for us to be successful in outbreaks, we really need these teams in place and trained before the outbreaks occur. Um, so through the PREDICT project, what we've been doing and working in, in coordination with the WHO, uh, FAO, and then all of our local partners, we've been trying to develop these One Health teams that go out in the fields together and do concurrent sampling of wildlife, livestock, and people. And then working from the field to the lab, I'm being cross-trained to go out in the field, do the work safely, and then get into the lab do the testing, and then ultimately, of course, report the results back in a One Health way, again, either at those One Health platforms or meeting individually with different ministries and sharing results together. And as we've talked about, you know, really, this starts in the communities. It starts in the communities and the ends in the communities. As Dr. Musonera said, once it gets to the hospital, it's too late. We want to figure out what's happening before. So we go out together, um, as I was saying, into the communities, depending on um, where we're working. And we, um, we set up teams that sample the wildlife, the domestic animals that live there, and then the people. And then a really important part of that is also doing surveys to understand how people and animals um, are coming together and how the contact's occurring. Because of course, that is where ultimately we're going to be able to mitigate that. So doing that in the field and the training all along is really, really important to develop that One Health team for the future. And then of course, we have been working in the hospitals as well, so that once people get sick, um, we're able to figure out what's happening in the hospitals. Is that different or the same as what's happening in the communities? And again, just some images of our teams going out together, sampling um, the ducks and also the people um, and then doing the surveys before going into the lab. So it's just to give you a snapshot of some of the high-risk interfaces that we've been working at um, across the world. Um, so of course, um, places um, such as in um, North Africa, where, where camels are important, especially when we're thinking about the context of MERS. Um, where pigs and, and poultry are coming close together, thinking about influenza. Uh, wildlife markets. Um, areas of unplanned settlements where people are coming in from um, rural areas into, into cities and coming in contact with many different species. So working at these high-risk interfaces where we think that contact between animals and people is really important and understanding that is really important for spillover to occur. And then like we've talked about many, many times, it really, really starts in the communities and with the local teams, having the local teams go into the communities, explain what the work we're doing, why are we there, getting that buy-in, and then that education to go back later, explain what we found, because the communities are the ones that are seeing the sick people first. So being able to understand and recognize that before it becomes a big problem is so important. And, um, and so that is you know, sort of really where it begins and ends. Um, so through the PREDICT project, we really, our goal there was to try to sort of really cast a wide net so that we could understand what is circulating in these different groups so that we could understand how spillover may occur. So getting into the field, sampling the people, we collect um, the, the samples that we think are important for spillover. So we aren't really just only interested in what's happening in the tissues, but what's happening in the oral swabs, the rectal swabs, the blood samples, the way people and animals are coming in contact with them. Um, and then getting into the lab and doing the training. We do a lot of really broad screening, what we call viral family screening, so that you can detect something like SARS coronavirus too, but you can also detect something else that might be related that we don't yet know about. And then of course, eventually you do want to do the genome sequencing and getting back into the field to understand um, the circumstances around these viruses. And then sharing results. We've talked about um, how do we get buy-in and really, Buy-in is early on. You need to have the different sectors know each other, have relationships with each other, and, and see the data together so that they can understand the importance of what's happening in the wildlife sector compared to what's happening in, in the human sector. And then, of course, in the communities, going back to the communities and sharing those data. So what I thought I would do, given that coronavirus is on our minds, is talk about how we've sort of actually um, implemented this work and using a One Health approach, but looking at um, coronaviruses. And I think we've all been thinking a lot about coronaviruses, especially the beta coronaviruses here that seem to have multiple hosts. And so trying to understand 
what is circulating in this multiple host and what can we learn about it. So through the PREDICT project, we went into the field and sampled um, almost 20,000 animals and people to try to understand what viruses were circulating in them. And um, really, you can see a large proportion of what we sampled were bats, but not just bats, um, primates, rodents and shrews and people trying to understand what is present in these, in these animals. And, and what you'll see very quickly is by far the highest number of positives were in bats. And more than 90% of the viruses that we found was in bats. So we certainly found viruses in people. We certainly found viruses in rodents. But by far, the high majority of positives were in bats. Now, if we were talking about loss of fever, this would be different. The, the, the family um, that we would really be targeting in terms of animals would be rodents. So different viruses have different relationships with um, different groups of animals. And this was really important information um, to, for, for us to sort of focus on and try to understand what is it about bats and what can we learn about the viruses in bats that can help us understand where the risk is, how to do surveillance, and, and how to potentially prevent this in the future. Sorry, my slides are being weird. Um, so this is sort of, you know, these viruses that we found in bats, where did we detect them? What you're looking at here is um, sort of a snapshot of the different positives that we found. The uh, gray dots are the alpha coronaviruses. So these are ones that we are used to when we're thinking about the common cold, like human coronavirus 229E or NL63. And then the ones in black are the beta coronaviruses. So these are the ones that cause things like MERS and SARS. And what you're looking at that is them overlaid with the species richness. So this is the bats where we found um, those viruses. So where you see red, you see a high diversity of bats, and where you see green, a lower diversity, or, or maybe we don't know. And what we learned very quickly was that where we found a lot of bats, we found a lot of coronaviruses. And where we found a lot of diversity of bats, we found a lot of diversity of coronaviruses. So really what we found that where the bats were was a big driver of where we found the coronaviruses. And so that's really important for us to think about how are we going to mitigate this in the future? Sorry, the slides are being annoying. Um, the other thing we wanted to think about was, okay, well, where are the animals positive and which animals are positive and are there differences around the world? And by far, really interestingly we found was the sample type that we were looking for the virus which was really important. So by far we found the majority of positives in bats in feces. We did find some in, in the oral swabs, but really feces were really important. Well, why is that important? That's important to think about how people are coming in contact with viruses in bats. And that is something that we can then think about how do we sort of mitigate it. It's also important for, for pooling resources. If you're trying to figure out where to find most of the viruses and how to do the testing. You can target things like feces and maybe oral swabs to a lesser extent to try to understand what might be happening. The second thing we found was that the young animals were more likely to be positive. So that's important, thinking about the context of the life history of the animals. When are there many young animals? When are there birth pulses? Because that's really good to inform on when the risk might be highest. So understanding when and where the positives can occur is also really important because it's that combination of not just the virus having the ability to infect people, but when is the virus being shed? And then when are the people coming in contact with those animals that are shedding those viruses? All of those things are really important to understand how to prevent spillover in the future. The other thing that we found was that certain viruses were associated with certain hosts. So I'm just showing you a couple of snapshots here. In the middle there, these are the two C coronaviruses, so the MERS-like coronaviruses. And we found that those guys were most likely associated or most likely found in Vespertilionid bats. These are little insectivorous bats. And that's important to think about how MERS might be shed uh, or MERS related viruses might be shed. And then in the context of this outbreak, we really wanted to focus on um, sort of who is shedding the SARS like coronaviruses. And, you know, from the SARS 1 outbreak, we found that binolophid bats were important, but also hippocyphrid bats. 
So again, why is this important? This is important for us to think about where might we target current surveillance efforts to think about where this current outbreak occurred, but not just where this current outbreak might have spilled over from, but how might these viruses spill over in the future? So again, what I have here is a map showing where we found SARS-related coronaviruses, those are the, the dots in, in black, across the globe, as well as where do we find the host that might carry those viruses. So again, what you're looking at here is an overlay of where we found the viruses with where you find hippocidorate and um, and rhinolophid bats in, in the world. So of course, when you do that, you see hotspot areas in Southeast Asia, which is of course where SARS-1 and we, where we think SARS-2 emerged. But look at this, hotspots in, in parts of West Africa, in Central and Southern Africa as well. So why is that important? You know, we get so focused on where things were found in the past, and then we get surprised when they appear in the future. You know, when Ebola virus occurred in West Africa, people were surprised. Well, we didn't think that it was there. It was really found, you know, prior to that in, in Central Africa. Well, we want to get past, you know, letting the, only the past inform in the future, but we need to be thinking about where these animals live, what viruses are these animals carrying, so we can be prepared for where they might emerge in the future. And we have found SARS-related viruses in Uganda and Rwanda. We're trying to understand more about them, what is their ability to infect human cells, and how closely related are they to other viruses that have spilled over in, in the past in places like, like Asia, so that we can put systems in place, surveillance in place to better understand how these things might emerge in the future in new places so that we don't continue to be surprised. And so what I just wanted to show you here is there's a number of hosts of coronaviruses. And of course, when we think about um, MERS, um, we know that um, camels might be important hosts. But if you look at this, by far you can see that bats are really, really important hosts of these viruses. The other thing that's important to see is that these viruses can be shared among multiple hosts. So trying to understand how that occurs and what leads to that is important so that we can again think about the circumstances of how to prevent that. Again, focusing here on the SARS-related coronaviruses, again, just because of the, the outbreak that's occurring, you can see that this is, this is SARS-1. And we know that that virus was, we think, spilled over from, from bats um, into maybe civets and has infected civets in people. But we found many other SARS-related viruses in bats. And so trying to understand them and their relationship to the current outbreak virus is, is obviously of, of interest. And so here is another tree just showing some of the viruses that we found across the PREDICT project as well as others. And you can see within this group, by far, a large proportion of these bat viruses um, I mean, a large proportion of these SARS-related viruses are found in bats. This is the original um, SARS, and here is the new SARS-2 coronavirus. And what you can see is some of them are able to use the ACE2 receptor, which is the receptor that, um, that um, SARS-1 and 2 uses to get into human cells, and some of them are not able to. And so trying to understand why some do and why some don't is really important. Also, just as a little highlight here, you can see this is the current SARS virus that's causing this pandemic. To date, the closest relative has been found in a rhinolophid bat, which is why we're thinking that this is where the virus may have emerged from. And then, of course, you can see the pangolin virus here just below that, showing that it is also closely related. So perhaps that's another clue suggesting that pangolins could be an intermediate host. So, of course, this is ongoing. We don't have this information, but the more we can understand what's happening in, in animals, build the teams to be able to get into the lab, do the work, and then back into the field um, to understand what's happening is going to help us to be better prepared um, in the future. And then again, finishing where you started, going back to the communities. One of these really successful things that this project did was develop this book called Living Safely with Bats. So when we go back, um, to, whether it's to the government and whether to the communities, we use this book to go back and talk about how to protect yourselves, how to live safely with these animals, how to recognize signs of these animals, because of course that's more important than what virus was found and, and where we found that. So with that I'm going to stop uh, because I don't want to take up all of the time. I'm happy to take questions but also would like to um, 
go back to the great conversation that's been having um, to talk a little bit more about experiences and take questions from, from the team. So thank you, Brian. Oh, yeah. um, thanks, Dr. Goldstein. That, that's fantastic. And I think, you know, uh, one of the nice things about the data and work that Dr. Goldstein showed is that that is work of, of, of really giant global teams. Uh, people on the call here, some of your, your faces I, I know and have known for many years, contributing in on different projects that have fed data into that, our colleagues in Asia under the Sayahoon networks and other, other countries. And uh, that shows that you know, we need a large team of experts and I'm glad we're building that community of practice here. I did see uh, Dr. Monica uh, had a question in the chat uh, directly related to your talk, uh, Dr. Goldstein, and then maybe we'll have to end the, F, uh, the questions. Is, I think it's a relevant one though. She asks, uh, essentially are in your maps, uh, the showing risk of rhinolophid and hippocyterus bats, and there was no gradient of risk or density of species in North America or Europe for that matter, or across Russia in that part of Asia. Uh, is it because there's no bats there or because the study was only focused kind of in you know, Latin America, Africa, Asia, or Southeast Asia? That's a really good question. Um, so in part, those maps were created based on um, the species that we found um, the viruses in. So we were trying to understand where was the risk um, in the regions for the species that we found um, the viruses in. Um, but you touch on two things. One is um, there are bats in other areas. In, in some places, North America is not one of them. We actually do know a fair amount about the species and the distribution of bats in North America. But there's a lot of missing data still, especially in um, sort of parts of Africa, um, where we actually don't really know what the distribution of these species are. I think a lot of studies now are starting to put tags, including work by Dr. Bird and Dr. Randoa and others on, on this call today, um, by putting tags on these animals and trying to really understand what the distribution is. It's amazing that in this day and age, we, we think we know so much and yet there's still so much to learn. So those maps are a combination of not knowing the distribution of animals, or focusing um, on, on the species that we were trying to target to show where the risk was for the viruses where we found um, those, those, um, those bats. Uh, thank you for that, yeah. So there's so much to know, so much to learn. Uh, we, our children's 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 careers will be still trying to answer the questions we're discussing here, I think, because there's, there's such a depth of, of diversity and interesting things in the disease ecology and, and mammal ecology of world. So with that, I'm gonna end this part because we're, we're pretty much at time uh, and turn it back to Dr. Smith and Dean Bezeo uh, for their uh, uh, thank yous. And I'd like to thank the speakers and everyone for participating. I really appreciate the energy and enthusiasm because only together are we gonna stop these kind of uh, disease problems around the world. So thank you, Dr. Smith, back to you. Thanks, Dr. Bird. I wanted to share just one quote that came from our Southeast Asia session last night, because I think it's relevant. And then I'll give our final comments to Dean Bezeo. Um, but uh, Dean Belisario from the Philippines last night um, was giving a very nice talk. And one of his summary statements was that he finds that there's four C's that we should be all thinking about. So that was to coordinate, to collaborate, to have consensus, and to communicate. And if we can focus on those four C's, we can accomplish a lot together. So I just wanted to, to leave you with that thought and to go to Dean Bezeo for any final comments he might want to share today. Thank you, Otrina. Thank you, Brian. I think today was very, very fantastic. I must, I believe all of the participants must have been enlightened. Uh, I'm excited that the, the last presenter it was real nice. Tracy, that was very nice. You very I think you have done a great you, did, you have done a great job. And uh, I hope we shall translate that into our own. I want to thank Monica, Irene, and uh, Mark for your for your presentation. But I want also to thank in a special way the CDC, although they are not here, or they may be here. This program, they, they created the, the field epidemiology laboratory training program, which cuts across the East African countries, and I guess some other countries, has helped a very big, a big portion of fighting COVID. I know that Monica said it, but maybe she didn't 
emphasize it. We have all the fellows deployed in all the 100 hubs, collecting and screening the, 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 the people. But I must also say that those who pass through the program are the ones who are actually doing a great job and teaching those in service. So somewhere, somehow, I think we need to find a way of multiplying this. I know the CDC has a program of their own, which is very, very popular, but we need to multiply this in, in Africa and Asia. I would like to thank my co-host, Jonah, uh, that he, this has been great. And I said, as I said at the beginning, that we look forward to doing this more regularly to inform ourselves. And as, some, and as somebody said, we need to build the capacity. This is the time because COVID found us with some capacity, but now it has woken us up that we need to build the capacity, prepare for even the worst, the worst that may come. Now, there is this issue of our other countries that do not have these programs. I think this is our time, as the, I talk from the point of view of Oshia of Rahun, where we have been admitting members or people coming to become members of Oshia. I think I urge my, my, my team, my board, to consider admitting as many as possible so that they can benefit from this training that we have. The resources may not be enough, but spreading to them and the training them through the African Union, the East African community, COMESA, I think it makes a lot of sense because what we have seen, when it comes, it does not hit one country. We need to help each other. Lastly, I want to thank our, our colleagues who are on, the, on, this, on this call who, who work in the labs. We keep talking about the healthcare workers, the veterinarians. But I think the people who work in the lab have a lot of contribution that they have done. And the, from, the, from Tracy's presentation, you can see the role of the lab. And I think we need to bring them to the front line when we are working or when we are going out. At times, as, as Irene and Monica said, at times people may go without the lab and the lab follows. I think we need to have the lab going first. Last but not least, I want to thank all the team at UC Davis, ECHO team, uh, and all the presenters that we have had in all the seven sessions, and all the participants that have attended all the seven sessions. There are common faces I see on the, on the screen. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you soon.